praise him, we worship him. Yes, we do. I like to take the Bible and go through it and understand it. I like to um, consider it. I like to see where there's necessary sometimes um, questions to be dealt with, where there's necessary changes that I might have even thought one way, but the Lord shows me another way. And then prove it by the Word of God. And put it out for conjecture, for thought. Um, you teach doctrine never dogmatically, but you teach it open for question, open for consideration, <coughs> open for counsel. You can teach doctrine dogmatically if you meet an apostolic person rooted and grounded in what we call the apostolic doctrine, how many knows what the apostolic, I didn't say the apostles, no. I said the apostolic church. teaching, how many knows what the apostolic teaching is in contrast to the trinity teaching? You know what the Trinity teaching is. You know what the apostolic teaching is. Um, if I meet one of them, they're dogmatic. You cannot tell them there is not the Trinitarians, three separate persons in the Godhead. God the Father, he's one. God the Son, He's two. God the Holy Ghost, he's three. he's three. That is taught from Catholicism into Baptist, Methodist, Adventist, Presbyterian, Pentecostalist, um, Congregationalist, um, Mormonism, um, Witnesses, no, witnesses do not. They do, they do not. But Trinitarian teaching. And uh, what, what was that, Brother Don? Nazarenes. Nazarenes, Nazarenes teaching steadfast. Uh, Presbyterian, so. The apostolic teaching is taught United Pentecostal Church, United Pentecostal Church of the World, um, United Pentecostal Church of uh, the True Church. Um, and there's several, there's six divisions of the Apostolic Church. They teach oneness. You cannot tell them that there is not one God. Three in one. God the Father is one, but the, the Son is the Father. And the Holy Ghost is the Son, the Son but he's of the Father. So that is three in one. That's dogmatic. That's dogmatic teaching. Even when you try to show them the scriptures, they will not uh, usually back up. I have not had too many of them change. And they, they believe what they believe, and uh, I've, I've dealt with uh, some of their better. I discussed one time with uh, uh, Brother Welch, the uh, um, overseer of the Apostolic Church of Florida many years ago, and uh, he would not accept anything of what he felt was a true teaching. That was apostolic teaching. Now, I like to stir up your mind so that you can consider, and I don't teach dogmatically. I teach uh, doctrine with consideration. I'm going to probably uh, interject something here that will probably bring discussion, because I have been recently 
studying this, Michael, Michael, in the scriptures, who is Michael? We have taught him as Jesus, have we not? We have. I have taught you that, have I not? You have. <laughs> but let us consider. Consider. Just consider. We're not changing anything. We're asking you to consider. Is Michael Jesus in the scriptures? And if he is not, then who is he? Brother Mullo, you taught us that he was the uh, military. military name. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I taught you. Mm -hmm. I'm just stirring up your mind to think a different way. For consideration, not for change. Let's look at the 10th chapter of Daniel. Where Michael is very prominent. I started to go down another lesson tonight and one that you would probably agree with all the yes, way. I wanted to be, I wanted to stir up your mind tonight yeah. in Bible study. Because if you never have your mind stirred up, you can't consider. In Daniel 10, get over there here, in the 10th chapter of Daniel, I'll get there in a moment. And um, let's start with, um, well, let's, get, let's do the, the, the chapter. Let's start with verse 1. We'll get to Denton Michael. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar. That was his uh, Persian name. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Daniel went on a strict fast for three weeks. I heard it discussed in my time in the ministry, fasting, how complete is it when you really fast? Let's consider Daniel. His fast was so complete, he ate no pleasant bread, tasting bread, no bread, no pleasant bread, no bread, really. That's what he's saying. He ate no flesh, so there was no meat. And he did not obviously take any liquid in his mouth. I've heard it discussed that you fast, and you may drink some sustaining liquid, but not solid substance. I've heard people discuss that, and that was a fast. I've heard other people say, we fasted, but we drank water because the body dehydrates without water, which is true. But here Daniel mm -hmm. did not, because if he did not take wine, I'm sure he did not take water because he purposely cut himself off from any nourishment. A complete fast. It's just a thought I'm dropping in. Now, do you fast if you don't do that? I believe you can fast from limited food as well as a complete fast. Fasting is depriving yourself for a certain prayer to be answered, a relationship to God to be closer, drawing near the Lord, and a fast is what you 
are able to do, God does not want you to destroy your body. For instance, if you're weak already, if your weight would be very limited, and you would already be in a weakened state, you could fast with what God would let you fast with from depriving yourself of some food or some a drink. You're fasting, but you're not on a complete fast. You're not depriving yourself completely, but you are depriving yourself. And God does recognize, I believe, any sacrifice that we make. I know we can present our whole body a living sacrifice in a fast, as Daniel did here. Um, I would not condemn anyone if they told me they were fasting, but they were drinking water during that fast. They're depriving themselves of an element, food. <coughs> if they're doing it for his glory, if they're doing it because he convicted them, if that's what he convicted them to do, then give praise to God and uh, thanksgiving that they're able to fast in that measure. Then there's other kinds of fasting. Yes. Fasting from pleasure. Yes. That, that if you abstain from pleasure, yes. that is a fast. Yes. If you abstain uh, from things that you want to do to give yourself a great deal of pleasure and joy, and you just push that back, yes. separate yourself from fun time, from things that you'd ordinarily go out and do. You're fasting. You're fasting. You're fasting in that measure. But here Daniel did a complete sacrifice unto God. A total fast. I believe God saw that. Uh, verse 4, And in the 4 and 20th day in the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is a Nikal. Remember, this is one of the streams that flowed from the one river in the Garden of Eden. This is one of the streams of that one river. So Daniel, that river was still flowing in the land. This may give us an indication also that the land of Persia could have been near or the actual site of the Garden of Eden. Because Adeko is one of the streams of the four streams that flowed from the one river in the beginning. Interesting point. Uh, then I lift up my eyes and looked and behold a certain man clothed in linen. Now, here's another thought. <coughs> How do we picture angels? Well, in the universal church, they picture them with wings. Religious teaching and tradition has angels with wings, painting describing angels, usually they have wings. Artists showing them with wings. Daniel saw no such, no such thing. Daniel even used the expression, I saw a man. But this man was clothed in fine linen. Now let's see further. A certain man clothed in fine linen whose loins were girded with fine gold of up hands. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished breath, and the voice of his uh, words, like the voice of the multitude, revelation almost word for word 
the same description that is of Jesus in Revelation's first chapter. But Daniel sees him as a man, clothed in fine linen. Now this was before Christ left heaven, came to the earth in the form of holy seed in the womb of the, uh, Mary and became a man. Here Daniel sees him as a man. So when I see Jesus, I do not believe I will see anything not resembling the features, the body of a man. Only he will be glorious, describing him as the barrel stone, uh, describing him with golden uh, girdle about his loins, feet shining like polished brass, uh, eyes as flame of fire, voices of many waters. Um, but you'll see him as a man. Because this is what he said in Genesis 1 and 26. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. <clears throat> so God did not make me like the bird of the air, nor the lion in the forest. Or he didn't make you that way. He made us man. I know then he separated woman. But woman also contains the features of man, as man contained the features of woman. Uh, before he made woman, woman was in man. Woman is still in man. Man is still in woman uh, because he created us in that manner. So this is an interesting picture here that when we see Jesus, we will not see some type of strange creation. Daniel said, I saw him. He described him. In eight, verse 8, he said, therefore, I was left alone. No, no, I, I left a verse out, didn't I? Verse 7, and I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. You know, everybody doesn't see what you see when you see in the Spirit, when God is dealing with you. Others may simply be afraid. Everyone, when we're worshiping here in the Holy Ghost, they're not comfortable. There are people uncomfortable when the Spirit of God begins to move in a church. When the glory of God is falling and people are completely yielded to the Spirit of God and there's a great manifestation of Christ in the church, some people get afraid. They get fearful. They hide themselves. They may not leave the building, but they hide themselves. You can't touch them. You can't reach them. They're afraid. Doesn't affect me that way because I see the vision. Doesn't affect you that way because you see the vision. Uh, but they didn't see the vision. They fled to hide themselves because they were afraid. <clears throat> 